scripture reading for today will come from Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. Again, that's Luke Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. And it reads, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and said, When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn away, and he will, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and a disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Thank you, Josiah. It's a new year. Are you guys excited about that? I've heard a lot of people talking about the last year and about how they didn't like the last one and hoping this one's going to be better. So, uh, yes, this one's going to be better. Uh, We just decide that, right? Can't we do that? We don't have to wait for till it's done. I mean, we can just decide that now. Uh, this is going to be a great year um, because it's going to be whatever we make it. And we can make some great things. We can make happiness happen. We can make some good things happen. We can have some reasons to praise God. And that's the good news. There's people we know and care about and love, and so the good news is we can make this year whatever we want it. And then there's always the bad news. This year is going to be whatever we make it. (laughs) And we're going to have to make it because it's not going to just happen automatically. And so there are some things we're going to have to do in order to make this a good year. There may be some things we have to do in order to make this not a bad year. So we're just going to have to decide that there are some things that have to happen here. And uh, a lot of it has to do with our thinking. A lot of it has to do with our preparation. And so that's what we wanted to talk about today for a little bit is about this idea of preparation and what we need to do to be prepared for what God has in mind. And that really makes all the difference. We spent several years in Florida, and so we got to see hurricanes. How do you prepare for a hurricane? Well, you go to the store early. (laughs) We have some experience with that now. And uh, you make sure you have water And you get cans of food because by the time the hurricane gets there or about two days before, there's nothing left to buy in a store. It's very similar to COVID. However, the one difference is apparently COVID, you have to have toilet paper. In a hurricane, there was lots of toilet paper. Nobody cared. So I'm not sure why the difference is. But a hurricane, you could see it coming. I mean, you watched it for days and days as it crossed. It's this far, it's this much, it's, you know, it's a Category 5 now, it's a Category 4, it's going to make landfall, and they give you all these different cones and different ways to look at it, and yeah, they're right some of the time, not so much. But as it gets closer, you can tell, okay, it's coming, it's going to arrive at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. I mean, literally, you can just see it and watch it. Uh, And sure enough, the power goes out, the storm comes. We had to put on steel shutters on our house and board up all the windows. And but it's kind of a fun time. Not if you ask Nancy, but for me, it's kind of a fun time because you don't have to go to work. You're getting some time off. You have no electricity, so you can't watch anything or anything like that. But uh, it, it's kind of exciting to watch it as it goes by and the world blows by. Uh, and then you come out and you deal with all the stuff afterwards, and then we get back to normal again. But you can prepare. COVID is pretty hard to prepare for. Earthquake, 
There's no preparing. You don't know when it's coming. But there are some things that you know are coming. And some things are like that with God as well. And so the passage that has been read to us this morning deals a lot with this idea of preparation. The angel comes to Zechariah. This is the preparation stage about, you know, here's what's going to happen, Zechariah. You're going to have a son. Apparently they had been praying for this son. But Zechariah's kind of been praying, but not really ready at this point either. And he wants him to be ready because this son is going to be a special son. And he tells him about some of the things that are going to happen with this son. This son is going to start from the very beginning, from before he's even born. The Holy Spirit is going to be on him. He's going to be what's called a Nazarite, or take the Nazarite vow. There's going to be no strong drink. He's also not going to cut his hair. He's going to have some things about him that are holy before the Lord. And so it's important to realize this. He is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and there are these marks of holiness around him. And so we're able to see all of these things as Zechariah thinks about and gets ready for the coming of his son. Well, why is this so important? I mean, if you've had children, you understand, yeah, there are some things we need to do in order to get ready for the child. You know, have a place for him to sleep, get some milk, get whatever you need to, to be able to change diapers and that kind of thing. So there's some preparation. But this is spiritual preparation. This is, I want you to raise this child to be a servant of God. And so from the time he's born, I want you to be thinking about how he is the one to come before the Messiah. And so he gives him all of that preparation time. He says, I want you to make them a people that are prepared. And so that's really the task. The plan is he's going to turn the hearts of Israel back to God. That he is going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. That he is going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. That he is going to take the disobedient and bring them to wisdom and justice. Well, that's a lot. How do you get one guy to be able to do that? And especially it's your child. He's just been born, but there's the prophecy. There's what it says, and that's what you know is going to happen. And so the reason to tell Zechariah this is to get the child ready, to get Zechariah ready, because a lot of preparation is done for this. He's going to need to prepare his son. He's already a priest, so he has some understanding of things, and he's able to bring this about. A lot of our preparation, however, some of it's going to be physical and some of it is just mental. You just need to know that that's what's going to happen. And so if you know a hurricane is coming, you can do some physical things, but a lot of it's just mental. Uh, there's a certain period of time, don't go outside because it's going right by. Uh, there are some things you need to do when it's spiritual as well. And so he talks about this, and he talks about the things that they're going to need to know of what it takes. And a lot of it is just the way that you think. If you see a sign like this, be, pre be prepared, what would you think you needed to do to be prepared? Put on chains? Uh, there's not really a lot you can do. And most of our cars these days are front-wheel drive. They do fairly well. You can drive on ice. You can drive on snow. But what you have to do to be prepared is more mental than anything else. There's an adjustment you have to make. When you want to stop, the way to stop is do not slam on the brakes. Because you will not stop. You will just keep right on going. Sometimes front, sometimes sideways, sometimes backwards, but you will just keep right on going. Don't push on the gas if you want to go. Well, because tires just spin and it makes black ice underneath and 
you have to do everything way ahead. You have to watch way ahead. You have to see what's coming. Can you drive on it? Sure. I mean, not down here, but if you go to Flagstaff, yeah, there's some snow there, and the further up you get, there's more and more snow, and you can drive on it. But it's a mental thing that you would prepare and think about, okay, I need to do this differently. I don't just push on the gas to go. I don't push on the brake to stop. We're going to ease into both of those and be careful around the turn and be careful in all of those things. And so being prepared has as much to do with the mental things that go on as it does the actual physical things that you would do. So how did John prepare people? What was John able to do? I want to look at a couple of verses here about this in Luke chapter 3. And as we look at what John was doing, this in the first part of chapter 3 talks about John is able to come. In verse 4 it says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the one of the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is, <clears throat> Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so John comes as the voice in the wilderness. That's his place. That's what he's doing. And so that's what he comes to be able to accomplish. He's taking the passage of Isaiah and making it very, very literal. Israel's a wasteland. It's a wilderness. John makes this literal by actually going out and living in the wilderness. But the passage is referring to more than that. It's talking about Israel as being this wilderness, this wasteland, even with the temple, even with the priests, even with all the feasts and all the fasts, all of those things. It's still, it still, it isn't what it's supposed to be. It isn't what John is intending, and it certainly isn't what God wants. And so John comes to level things, to make it smooth, to prepare the way for them to be able to see the salvation of God. And he comes to prepare the people for this Messiah, that this Messiah would be righteous, and that he's going to set a new standard among the people. And they're going to need to be aware of who this is. To this point, they had become very aware of the law of God and of disobedience. But they didn't take it serious. Or they took it too serious, just depending on how you want to say that. They liked the appearance of it. They knew what it said. And certainly you would never be caught dead breaking a law. But if nobody was looking, I mean, it's not that critical, right? If nobody knows, is it really a sin? I mean, you know, somebody has to catch you at it, don't they? Or is it a sin anyway? And what they wanted to do was to look good before God and before others. But if nobody knew about the sin? And so it's a great emptiness that they have in their relationship with God. Their idols had changed from pleasure to prestige idols. I want you to look at me. I want you to think well of me. I want you to know how much money I give. I want you to notice all the works that I do. I want you to know I'm a 
great servant of the people. And so they would make all these proclamations and tell everybody about all the great work that they had done. Yeah, does it begin to sound familiar? Sometimes. And so what does John tell them to do? And so I have four things that John tells them. This is the way to prepare for the Messiah. The first one he says is repent. How does he know? I mean, it can't be everybody. Yes, it can be everybody. So repent. Repent of sins that you have done. Repent of not being what you should be. Repent of the things that have gone wrong. And then the second thing he tells them is, I want you to show fruit in keeping with the repentance that you have had. And so do things that look like you've repented. Do things that look like this. And so what about your worship? What about your prayer time? Will that change if there's repentance or will it just be the same? What about your care of others or loving your neighbor? Or... And so this idea of bearing good fruit, it's all about the fact that, you know, we've decided we're going to repent, we're going to live different, and here's what different looks like. And so he says, I want you to show fruit in repentance. The next one he says is, I want you to reconsider the stronghold of your faith. We may not pick up on that, but they were able to say, we're children of Abraham. We have the promise of Abraham. Our Messiah is coming. We're biologically children of Abraham, so therefore, we are fine. It doesn't matter how much we sin. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how insincere we are. It doesn't matter anything about the rest of it. We are fine. And he says, you need to look at that again. God's able from stones to raise up children to Abraham. It's not just a biological thing. It's not just the fact that you can say, okay, well, you know, we are Jews, children of Abraham, so we've got the promise, we're saved, we're fine. Makes you think about ourselves a little bit sometimes. You ever known people who grew up in church? We just kind of assume, don't we? We just kind of think it's always there. How do we do that? Maybe we need to look again at that, and that's what John is telling them. It's not that it's not true. Their point is valid. Yes, you are children of Abraham. Why are you acting like this? Let's act like we should be acting. And so is that true with us if we grew up in a Christian family and we've been Christian for a long time, we might need to go back and look at the stronghold of our faith and say, you know, is this really it? And especially right now, for us it might be sitting in church buildings on Sunday. That's been the way you're supposed to do it, right? That means you're faithful or sitting at home or letting it play on TV are we really engaged in worship to God? Are we really engaged in the things God's doing or in our giving? Or, you know, has all that kind of just gone away? And then the last thing is John sends his disciples to Jesus. He's not trying to hang on to anything. He's not trying to say, I have it all together. I'm going to be the one that takes you to God and everything else is fine. Uh, he says, no, I'm pointing you toward Jesus. There's the Lamb of God. That's where I want you to go. And so he's pushing them toward Jesus. All of this is in preparation for the Messiah, before the Messiah's even come. Seems like it would be preparation for us as well. So when we think about this, what happens with the crowd? Well, I think this is one of the interesting things that it includes in Luke chapter 3, in verse 10. It says, And the crowd asked him, What shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food to do likewise. 
tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you were authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by accusation. Be content with your wages. I find this so interesting because he's already told them, here's what I want you to do. And we already looked at four steps and then they go, well, but what about me? And I find this is so true of us. I can see what you need to do. I just don't know what I need to do. It's easy to see what you need to do and I don't know why you don't get it. Isn't that the way we all are? I can always see what somebody else needs. But sometimes it's harder to see what I have. And so he talks to the people who have extra food and extra garments and things like that. He says, you might want to be kind to somebody else. The one who doesn't have anything. And you might want to share that with somebody else. Tax collectors, he says, well, don't collect more than what you were supposed to. And that's really the reputation of the tax collectors at the time, is they collected much more than what was required. And so as you look at this, he's saying, I want you to be honest. I want you to not think of yourself. I want you to not put yourself first. Don't take advantage of all these things. Don't take advantage of your position. I want you to live different because everybody takes advantage of their position. He says, but not us. Not us. We don't do that. We are the ones who follow Jesus. And so what do we need to do to be prepared for Jesus? Well, I'm just going to take John's list again. I think it's the way to look at it. It's, it's what it's written down for is to say, here's what they did to prepare for Jesus. Well, ours is the same thing. To realize that, okay, there's sin in the world and I need to repent. And maybe it's repenting of things that have gone wrong or things that I haven't done. You see, if you're going to clean up your life, what does that really mean? I'm going to repent. I'm going to do things right. Well... If you're going to clean the house, it means you're going to take out the trash, right? I mean, start there. There's a lot more to it, and so we're going to take out the trash about the things that we don't want, the things that we don't need. Okay, that's even worse, isn't it? No, I just meant the trash in the trash can. No, there's a whole lot of stuff that you have, that stuff that you don't want, that you don't need, that's sitting in the back of the closet or back of the garage or somewhere that says, I've got all this extra. If you're going to clean up your life and clean up your house, then it's going to be deal with all of it, right? If you're cleaning up your finances, what does that mean? I'm going to get rid of debt. Well, except for the new thing that I needed. After all, it was Christmas and credit cards are way up here now. They're all maxed out because, no, if you're going to clean up finances, then you're going to deal with what's costing you more. You're going to deal with the debt. If you're going to clean up relationships, then what does that mean? It means there's not going to be any hard feelings that you're going to clear the air, that you're going to have dealt with all of those things, that you're not going to allow things like that to just keep going on and on, that you're going to do everything you possibly can. Now, you may not be able to clear it all completely, but you're going to do everything that you can. And so what do we do with God? Well, we're going to clear the air of all the mistakes, of all the trash, of all the debt, of everything that needs to be forgiven. And we're going to act like people who have been forgiven. People who have received grace. That's repent. Get rid of what doesn't belong in your life. And the second thing he tells us is to show fruit in keeping with repentance. Notice the way it's worded. It is not to show the fruit of repentance. It's not what it says. 
It's not to give an apology. Oh, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. It's to show fruit in keeping with the repentance. In other words, show the life that you've been given. The repentance is the turning around and the sorrow for the past, but that's not what he's trying to get us to show. He's trying to say, what does your life look like because you have done that? And so fruit is about living like someone new. And so if we've been given grace because we have this new life, a life of grace would then bring grace to other people's life. Right? And if we have the love of God, a life-given love would extend love to other people. And if we believe, because God believes in us, then we would believe in other people as well. And we would share the things that were given to us, this life that we have now, because of our repentance, and we would bring out the fruit of a life that has repented and all the good things and blessings of God we would share with other people. And then I think this one's important. Reconsider the stronghold of your faith. Especially right now, because things are so different, aren't they? I mean, it used to be we could tell when you had a great church by how full it was. Well, there are no churches full anymore. Does that mean all churches are bad? Not at all. Because there's a whole lot of people that are at home, a whole lot of people that are watching online, a whole lot of people who are engaged with this. It could be even bigger than it was before. Now, the fact that they're silent, we're going to take that to mean that they love it, that they approve of it, they think it's all wonderful, right? Well, at least, you know, that's the way I'm going to take it. And so what do you do as the marks of a Christian? It used to be that a person was considered faithful if they attended church three times a week. Do you remember those days? You had to be here Sunday morning, which you are. This is great. You are not. Well, okay, yes, you are. Because you're tuned in, and you're here, and it may be Monday morning, I, know, I realize. But anyway, and then Sunday night was also thrown in there. We haven't had Sunday nights for a long time. We had connect groups. But were you going to your connect group? A lot of people are not. And then Wednesday night, we had a class, and that was considered important because we got to see people, we got to fellowship, we got to learn some more, and so Bible class was important. And we haven't had Wednesday night Bible class in, well, since March. And it's a new year already. And yeah, there's been videos that have been put out every single week. I hope those have been beneficial. And that you're able to use those. Those are all listed on our website. But are you doing that? Is that a mark that we can say? It's not attendance three times a week somewhere. It's not the gathering together. It's not. We got to come up with a different standard of what is our stronghold. What does it look like to be a Christian now when you cannot get together? when a lot of it is online? Can we still have the kind of faith that God wants and do it online? Because it is personal, it is within us. And are there ways we can reach out to other people and be of service to them? But that used to be the thing too. You could reach out to other people and it was how many service projects are you involved in? Not anymore. In fact, that's probably not a good thing for you to be involved in a lot of service projects for other people because we can't be around them. And the one thing we would share is more disease. It isn't that this world doesn't belong to God anymore. It's that we may have to redefine what faithful means. 
And please don't give up on the idea of being faithful. And please don't hold everybody to something they absolutely cannot do. Because some people can be in mass, some people can be here, some people can't. But we can all be Christians, and we can all serve God, and we can all follow God. And so what does faithful look like? It may not be the same things. And so we're looking for opportunities to be righteous. How do you do that? And I think all of us are still trying to answer that question. And that's part of what we're going to be looking at in this year. How are we able to do that? And then the last one, follow Jesus. That's where John pointed everybody. That's what we are. We're disciples of Jesus. And as you follow Jesus, then tell somebody else. Get them to follow Jesus. Point someone else to them. Point other people to Jesus. Be around the people that know him as much as you can, whether it's online or whether it's in person. So are we ready for Jesus? Are we prepared for Jesus? I don't mean the big comeback at the end. That's always the thing we look for. Well, I hope it's not today. Hope it's not till next week or next month or maybe next year or, you know, I'm ready for Jesus as long as it's not today. I'm not talking about the big one where he comes back and the world ends and all of that. I'm talking about the little one where he comes to your house for dinner. Are you ready for Jesus to come and be personal in your house for dinner? That's what Zacchaeus found himself as he's looking for Jesus and Jesus says, I'm, I need to stay at your house. Okay. And what's the first thing he does? Repent. Does it kind of follow the pattern? All the stories seem to support exactly what John's been talking about here. Or Simon the Pharisee, he invites him over. Jesus, I want you to come to my house. Come to my house for dinner. And the sinful woman who happens to show up at his house is more prepared for Jesus than Simon is. Because she's broken. Because she has gotten herself ready by her repentance, by her offering to Jesus. And so we can see that maybe it's not done quite the same way. But Jesus is here. I saw this. I'm ready, Jesus. I'm watching, I'm waiting. And part of me does not like this. Looks cute. I thought that looks so cute. Got her teddy bear, got her little suitcase. But while we're watching and waiting, we're not just sitting. Uh, and if this conveys that concept, then that's not the right thing. It's more the idea of us going and telling, of active waiting. When they were in the upper room waiting for Jesus, there were prayers, there was worship, there were songs, there was a time when they were together. And it was not just sitting. It is not just sitting. It's being busy while we're waiting for Jesus and ready for Jesus. In fact, Jesus is among us at communion, correct? He was here with us. So please don't miss the point that Jesus is in our world today, that he is working among us. And the most prepared person for Jesus might be the one that's broken. The one who has COVID or leprosy and can't be healed, but he understands he needs to be healed and he gives up his life for Jesus. He feels the shame of his sin and the regret for the mess. And there is something specific Jesus can do. And it's in us finding another broken one and pointing them to Jesus. Are you ready for Jesus? And so let us prepare ourselves and the world to meet Jesus. I think we have the same task 
we've been able to talk about it. Let's see if we can't make this year the year that we have prepared everyone to meet Jesus. Whether he comes again in the sky and the world is over, or whether he just comes to your house for dinner. Are you ready to meet Jesus? What do you need to do? We'd be glad to talk with you and pray about that. Would you come while we stand and sing?